one well-known preacher put it to me once that prayer is like going on a diet. It's something he thought about doing and read about doing, but rarely got on with doing. If you've been a Christian any length of time, you will know that prayer is the greatest privilege in the world. The God of the universe listens intently to the cries of our hearts. We know prayer to be a great privilege. And yet, we're so slow to take advantage of the privilege. We struggle, perhaps, to get out of bed in time to pray. We find that our minds wander when we do pray. We fall asleep when we're meant to be praying. And in the end, the subject of prayer becomes a source of guilt and condemnation. We know we're meant to be having this wonderful relationship with God through prayer when much of the time we fail. I don't know if you can relate to any of that, Perhaps you've got prayer sussed. Perhaps you are perfectly disciplined and you're walking in faith and victory. I'm delighted if that's true of you. For the rest of us, I want to talk today about the context for prayer and next week, the content of prayer. A lot depends on getting the right context for prayer. A lot of people tell me that they pray in bed in the night and before they know it they're asleep. I think it's great that you found the answer to insomnia but actually prayer is more than this. More than a way of lulling ourselves off to sleep. Three things to say about the context for prayer. Pray in private, verses 5 and 6. Pray in normal speech, verse 7. And pray in confidence, verse 8. Firstly then, pray in private, verses 5 and 6. Jesus has just been teaching on giving. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And the burden of what Jesus says is that we should give in secret. Nobody else should know what we give. In verse 4, only our Heavenly Father should know what we give, so that he alone can reward us. And it's the same in prayer. It's so tempting to try and project an image of our being a great prayer, a great person of prayer especially if you've been a Christian a long time and you've got quite good at the art of public praying. I remember the first time I prayed out loud in a Christian meeting. My heart was pounding. I rehearsed in my head what I was going to say. But over the years, it gets easier and easier to pray in public. You get accustomed to it. And that's a good thing. It's great to encourage others by praying out loud in a prayer meeting. But if you don't pray in private, Jesus says it's hypocritical to pray in a meeting with other people. Verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I was walking home the other day and I heard a man praying very loudly as he walked along. I paused to listen to what he had to say. He seemed to be praying a sound prayer, but he was doing it very publicly. He was doing a prayer walk and praying for the people living in that particular street. 
thought, what am I, am I to make of this? I thought, it's brilliant that this man wants to pray. It's fantastic that he wants to pray for the Holy Spirit to work in this street. But I was uncomfortable at the way he was drawing attention to himself. Jesus says, it's the hypocrites who love to pray in public. Now, I expect this man was very sincere. I'm sure he was not a hypocrite. I'm sure his public praying was backed up by a private prayer life. But nonetheless, I was uncomfortable. Jesus is saying it's hypocritical to pray great prayers in public if we're not praying great prayers in private. Why do the hypocrites love to pray when they are seen by others in the synagogue, on the street? They love to pray in public because everyone will then conclude what a great person they are. If that's your motivation, verse 5b, Truly I tell you, says Jesus, they have received their reward in full. If you want to look good, if you want to look like a great person of prayer, if that's the reward you're looking for, you can have it. Pray great prayers in public and you will receive your full reward. People may be impressed by you. That's your reward. However, Jesus wants us to discover a greater reward than this. Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So we have a choice. We can go for the reward of people. We can go for the reward of other people being impressed by us. Or we can go for the reward of our Heavenly Father. We can pray in private so that only He hears us. Only he is impressed. I don't want to set myself up as a great man of prayer. I do make time to pray every morning. I do keep a prayer diary. I do work through my list. I do try and pray for the whole church, try and pray for family and friends. But my mind does wander, sometimes an awful lot. Sometimes I fall asleep. I haven't got it all sussed. But I have got hold of the fact that God wants me to pray to him, to talk to him in private. This means I can tell him anything. I can share my innermost problems and challenges with him, because only he hears those prayers. So pray in private. Secondly, pray in normal speech, verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Someone asked me recently, how do I manage to pray for the whole church? for all the different needs that there are. Now, I'm not claiming to be a wonderful man of prayer, but I do my best to pray through the church prayer list and to pray for other people. And one of the reasons I can do this is that I don't use many words. I don't heap up phrases. I just ask God for things in normal speech. When I was growing up in Wales, prayer was a very significant part of church life. There were no home groups, but there was a central prayer meeting 
and Bible study every Tuesday evening. And at the prayer meeting, there were some great prayer warriors. I think they were people of prayer in private as well as in the prayer meeting. But what struck me at the time was what great orators some of them were. They could really pray up a storm. And people would pray for 10, 15, 20 minutes before they sat down and let somebody else have a go. At the time, I tried to become a great orator in prayer. I tried to fit in. Since then, I've somewhat been in reaction against this. In fact, I think I've lost the art of praying great oratorical prayers. This is because, as a pastor, I want people to hear the encouragement of Jesus here. We don't need to babble like pagans. We don't need to use many words. We can be very succinct. When I phone my earthly father in Bridgend, I don't make a great speech to come into his presence. I just say, hello, Dad, how are you? And I've realized that when I pray to my heavenly father, I don't need to make a great impressive speech. I don't have to pray up a great storm. I can just talk to my Heavenly Father in normal speech, just as I would talk to anyone else. Certainly, I, we must come to him with reverence, even fear. We mustn't be overly familiar with God. After all, he is the Lord of the universe. I am only a very insignificant sinner. I should approach God with reverence. The reason I'm accepted and welcomed in God's holy presence is not that I can pray like a great orator. It's not that I can make great speeches. The reason any of us is accepted in God's presence is that we're trusting in Jesus. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all our sin and to open up the way into God's presence. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. We come to God the Father in the authority of Jesus. Jesus is absolutely welcome in his Father's presence. And so we come to God in his authority. We come as those who are in Christ. We belong to Jesus. We're trusting in Jesus. We have nothing to add to the goodness of Jesus. Jesus is good enough for God's presence. And when we're forgiven by Jesus and filled with the spirit of Jesus, and given the perfection of Jesus, we can come right into God's presence. No special speech required. No need to babble. No need to use many words. No need to heap up phrases. Just talk to your Heavenly Father. Just talk to your spiritual bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. Just talk to your brother and friend, the Lord Jesus. Anyone can manage this. 
a young child can talk to Jesus. A brand new Christian can talk to Jesus, just as we would talk to anyone else. So pray in private, pray in normal speech, and thirdly, pray in confidence. Verse 8. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Don't be like the pagans trying to impress their God with their great eloquence and oratory. There's no need to be anxious when we approach God, provided that we belong to Jesus, provided that we're trusting in Jesus, as long as we've made Jesus our King, as long as we believe that when he died on the cross, he paid there for all our sin, as long as we definitely are a Christian, we can pray with great confidence. We haven't got to try and impress God. Don't be like the pagans because your father knows what you need before you ask him. But what's the point of prayer then? If God already knows before we ask him. The answer is that prayer is not an attempt to persuade God to do something which he hadn't previously thought of. God is not relying on us to let him know what's going on. He already knows all things. What's the point of prayer then? It's for our benefit. It does us good to bring all our needs to God. Freely to confess before God how much we need him. How much we trust in him. God loves us, and he loves to hear from us. He knows all things. He knows what's going on in our lives before we say a word. But because he's our loving father, he loves to hear our voice. It's just like me with my children. I could receive a weekly email updating me on everything that's going on in my children's lives. But how much better when we pick up the phone and actually talk to each other? I love to hear their voice. I love to be in relationship with them. In the same way, we can pray with great confidence. God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He's the king. He's in control of all things. He's working out his plan for the world, to save a people for himself, to glorify his son, the Lord Jesus. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our prayers. But he loves us. He wants to hear from us. He wants to hear about the issues we face. Imagine if God were not the king, if God were not in control of all things. Then we'd be very anxious. If I thought God is relying on me, God is relying on my prayer to keep the universe on track, that would be too much, wouldn't it? Too much responsibility. Robbie and I went for a sleepover with some Christian friends. The idea was to have a barbecue in the garden and then to camp in the garden overnight. Unfortunately, Robbie managed to burn his finger on the campfire. This rather spoiled things. And our host said to me, Oh, if only I'd prayed more today. Then this never would have happened. Is that right? 
Are things just waiting to go wrong if we fail to pray hard enough? No. God has a perfect plan and purpose. He's going to work out that purpose. Our prayers just submit to his plan. Our prayers are for God's will to be done, as we'll see next week when we look at verse 10. It may be God's plan for me to have a perfect day in which there are no difficulties and no problems. Or it may be God's will for me to face challenges today. My part, our part, is to pray with great confidence. Lord, you already know all things, even before I ask. I know I can trust you, so I'm bringing my prayers to you. Pray in private. Pray in normal speech. Pray with great confidence. How is your prayer life? Are you in a good routine? Do you go to bed in good time so that you can get up early enough to have a prayer time the next morning? What about keeping a prayer diary? The church produces a prayer diary with the names of everyone who attends Christchurch. So you can pray for different people on each day of the month. We can all pray for each other in this way. And then what about making our own prayer diaries for all the other people we have to pray for? I find this is so helpful because when my mind wanders, which it does, I can then bring myself back. Oh, who's next to be prayed for? So are we praying in private? Do we go into our room, close the door, and pray in secret? It's a wonderful privilege. The God of the universe is listening to each one of us when we do this. And we don't need to babble and use many words and heap up phrases. We don't need to use grand oratory. We can just use normal speech. And we can have great confidence in prayer. God knows everything anyway. He's going to work out his purpose, come what may. And that takes all the pressure off in prayer. I haven't got to save the world through my prayers. Jesus has already taken the job of saviour of the world. Our task is just to bring our needs to God in prayer. Knowing that he loves us. He loves you. And he's in control. We really can trust him. So I thought maybe we could spend a few minutes praying around our tables. These are just suggestions. How about this? Ask God for one thing for ourselves, one need we have, one thing for our family, one thing for our church. Or you may have a much better idea of what to pray for. Have a think and then do some praying around our tables and then Becca will come back.